Hi, and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. My name is Paul Marco, and welcome to the fifth edition of the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. If you've been uh, keeping up with these, you know that we're discussing relevant things to people who are targeted by the government for various reasons, uh, usually technologically. Today, we have with us Millicent Black, we have Karen Stewart, and we have Catherine Horton to discuss Mostly we're going to focus on today, we're going to focus on police and their duty and their dereliction of duty and their unresponsiveness to people in need and their total responsiveness to the global elite. So uh, thanks for getting on board. I'm sorry we were a little late today, but uh, something, some strange thing happened and uh, we were off the internet at 10 o'clock. So, we had to wait till the internet came back, but we're all here and we're, we're raring to go and uh, start a discussion. So withhold your beliefs, get ready to go into another dimension with the Techno Crime Fighter Forum. Uh, who would like to start? Anybody? Well, I would, I would probably like to say that um, up until this point, I had immense respect for the police. I did start to worry about how the government was militarizing police. I mean, you know, how many uh, tanks do you need to get a, uh, to make a man leave the house who's drunk and being disorderly to, and, and uh, abusive to his wife? I mean, do you need, you know, 15 guys with uh, machine guns and a tank? Really? Do you need that? But, um, you know, I found with trying to go to the police with my problems, and I see that with uh, all the TIs, you know, everybody who's been targeted by the government, that the police are either uh, totally unresponsive and then they're very quick to be abusive and tell you that, oh, this type of thing doesn't exist. You can't possibly be a victim of it. Therefore, you must be crazy. And then when you give them ample proof, and in Millicent's case, more than ample proof, in fact, I have said it before, she has one of the best documented cases where the technology has been uh, <laughs> brought to them in papers and papers and papers to say, yes, this does exist. You know, and yet they say, they've told Kath, Dr. Horton and myself, oh no, she, Milson hasn't given us any proof this is going on. Well, what in the world kind of proof do you need? I mean, the police basically are being told, I think, that with the post 9-11 laws in place that basically subvert the constitution, that, they, that there is a class of person that they are not allowed to help. We are being denied our rights and due process. And the police think because the feds tell them that this is law. Well, that's why we have a constitution. A, the country with a constitution is a country of law and not of men. Well, what does that mean? That means that the law is the law and it applies to everyone equally that if I shoot somebody, that I should go to jail, you know, if I shoot somebody for nothing, and that the guy who's a billionaire down the street, if he shoots somebody for nothing, he should go to jail. And if the guy who's, who sweeps the, the, the floor at the school, if he shoots somebody for nothing, he needs to go to jail. He needs to be applied equally to every person. That's why we are citizens. We are not objects, we are not possessions, but that is what a country of laws is. And the police are told that we are now exempt from being citizens and getting due process. And so they are sitting on their butts and they are denying that we are saying anything of any importance. In fact, some of them are even motivated to try to entrap and um, basically continue the slander and try to put us in jail or try to put us in mental institutions because we are telling the truth. All right. Um, this is unconscionable, is absolutely unconscionable. And for the police to either participate, which some of them are doing, 
or sit there and allow people to abuse and slow kill murder you, they're not police. They're not oath keepers. They're oath breakers, and they are absolutely uh, a shame. And I'm, I'm thoroughly disgusted by what is happening with the police because uh, according to Marbury versus Madison, which is a Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. from a long time ago, I mean, the, the Constitution was challenged almost at the start. And Marbury ver versus Madison asked, if a law is passed anywhere in the United States or on uh, US territory that actually is contrary to the Constitution, is that law valid? And Marbury versus Madison took the justices, the Supreme Court justices, 10 years to decide because they went back and they read every single document, every single personal letter of every founding father to see their intent. And their decision was that is passed in the United States or on any United States territory that goes contrary to the Constitution is void. It does not fit with the Constitution, then it is void. And all of these police are basically paying attention to and following the direction of laws that are void. They're absolutely void. There is no nothing in the Constitution that says you can at whim declare somebody uh, a, you know, a terrorist, put them on the watch list for less reason than probable cause. Now, Obama passed a, a law in uh, either 2013 or 2014 saying, you don't even have to have probable cause to put somebody on the terrorist watch list. That is absolutely an outrage. And Trey Gowdy interviewed a, uh, an executive from the Department of Homeland Security on TV, and he said, <laughs> Basically, can a person write to the Department of Homeland Security and find out if they are on the terrorist watch list? Her answer was no, we will not tell them. And he was outraged. And then he said, now, can a person who suspects they're on the terrorist watch list, can they write and request to be taken off of it or for their case to be reviewed? And if found that they've done nothing in the world, which the 99.9% .9 of the TIs, if not 100%, have done nothing to be on this list. And he said, if, you, if they write and say, can you review my case and take me off if you find there's no evidence I've done anything, you know, and she said, no, we won't do that. So once you're on this fascist Nazi list, apparently you're no longer a citizen, you're no longer a human being, you no longer have civil rights, and that is how they are uh, circumventing the law to abuse you and in some cases murder you. And these police think that just because the feds say so, that that makes it law. They are absolutely, totally, totally ignorant of the constitution. I find that unconscionable that the police force would be ignorant of the constitution. And uh, you know the, the American people that you talk to are abominably, abominably ignorant of the Constitution. They have no idea. And that's how you get all of your rights taken away. And that's how you get into a totalitarian government is just gross ignorance and a willingness to be a sheep and do anything that you're told. Uh, you know, I'm, you can tell I'm outraged. I'm absolutely outraged. And Millicent has been so abused, so abused. And the police could find something. I, I have spoken to um, Captain Potts in Tennessee where M Millicent lives, and I said, if you took the person who was behind Millicent's targeting and you brought him to a psych ward, just like you, you know, people are get Baker acted all the time, rightfully or wrongfully, you know, the police have no problem tricking people or dragging people away to put him in a psych ward, even just out of retribution, you know, but he can't be persuaded to have this man come in for a psych evaluation because I said to him, I said, this man would no doubt turn out to be evaluated as a psychopath. So why can you not do this? And I have even called Army Intelligence at Fort Bragg and told them what's going on with Millicent and, and asked them, begged them, pleaded with them three times to contact Captain Potts in Tennessee and aid him in dealing with this problem. And I will now probably just shut up and let Millicent tell you what exactly the problem is. But the police are letting us down 
and there's no excuse for it. I am referring to them now as oath breakers, and I would like them to step up and show me wrong, prove me to be wrong. And this is the time to do it. All right, now shut up. <laughs> I have been um, physically, I started being physically stalked by a retired Air Force person in 2007. And, and when I say physically stalked, he was actually coming in and out of my house between 1999 and 2004, setting me up for this. But the high-tech torture actually started in 2003. So he even continued to come a year after the high-tech torture started. Um, but stopped trying to contact me in 2004. I guess he was then solidifying what he was going to be doing to me once he retired. Um, he retired in 2007, started physically stalking me. I began gathering evidence in 2010 and began to approach the police department in 2011. In 2010, though, I started calling Military One Source, and I've got a whole log of the calls that I made to Military One Source making complaints about this guy. The first person told me, get a weapon, ma'am. The second person told me to contact um, Fort Campbell, Kentucky's military police. When I called them, they gave me someone else. And so it's just kind of been a merry-go-round of people giving me referrals one to the other. However, in 2011, things began to break for me when I went to the President's Commission on Bioethical Issues and stood there and made my complaint against the President's Commission um, about being the non a non-consensual human experimentee. When I came back, I moved... Uh, I've been being their puppet in 2003. What I, one of the things I heard was the boys have new toys. Uh, this guy actually has a, um, his military training confirms that he have the, the mind control, trauma-based mind control programming for, uh, um, training. All of his military bases are reported mind control programming sites. And, um, Someone in DC actually helped me to get his, his, his training record, which confirms that he has some of the training that allows remote contact that I've been having and the remote assaults. So I began getting of his involvement from talking to a federal investigator who said to me, he's, he's a liar. He said he is, does not have clearance from the Air Force to do this to you. He also said to me, and it's not a real investigation, he said, if it was, I would have been through with it in three days. At the time I was talking to this investigator, it was eight years since the high-tech torture began, four years since Randy Webster retired from, and I wasn't to call his name, retired from the Air Force and began to physically stalk me. Um, but from 2003 forward, the high-tech torture has just escalated. Um, 2007, which was the year this person retired, I began hearing him talk to me via subliminal messaging day and night. To this day, I still hear him. Um, and it, it's, it's very abusive. He talks to me through my bath. He talks to me through the night. Every time I'm awakened, he's talking. All through the day, he's talking. He belittles me. He questions me. He tries to talk nice to me to see if I'll talk nice to him back. Always, it's in, it seems to be real time. Maybe 15% of the time is computerized, but the majority of the time, is, it seems to be real time. It seems that we're brain to brain linked. Now, his, his photograph shows that he is a pilot. And what I found out in my research is, is that pilots are chipped so that they can have sublimial communication in case they're shot down in enemy territory. So apparently he has a chip in me that links my brain to his and allows him to have all of this contact, which essentially makes him a handler. And he does use neuro-linguistic programming um, because I can recognize the times that I can't think clearly anymore. Usually that's when he's talking the most in my head. So I, I, and I did find out that that's the way that they can shut you down. Nevertheless, I began taking my evidence to the police department. Uh, in my hometown of Mount Pleasant, which is just 10, 12 miles down the road, the police department there had a police sergeant who took an interest in what was happening to me. What happened though with that sergeant is he admitted to me that he had 
been in Marines Intelligence. While in Marines Intelligence, he had helped the CIA do LSD experiments on the Vietnam veterans. So he asked me, does Webster have a circle of friends? Do they get together and compare data? So that made it then sound like he was still using me for research, which is essentially what he had said, but he said it subliminally so that he could not uh, be said that he said it to me from his mouth. That police sergeant though came to my house I first talked to that sergeant in June 2012, 2011. He came to my house exactly two days after this person was elected to the city planning commission. So now he's an old boy uh, and forced me into a, a, an ambulance. He said he had a warrant that was issued by a judge. I asked to, to bail out to see it. He wouldn't let me see it. He, he just waved it at me, gave me the name of a judge. But then he, his lieutenant, and an officer came into my home uninvited but they came into my home and was trying to get me to go out and go into a waiting ambulance uh, i was refusing my my phone rang at that point and the director of the institute against domestic violence in the african-american community called me i had called him when the officer first started to my home and and he didn't answer so but he called me back so i told him what was happening he said where are you? I said, I'm standing in my home. He said, you where? I said, standing in my home. He said, and they're in your home? I said, yeah, they're standing here and they want me to go and get in an ambulance. So he said, well, what does the warrant say? I said, he won't let me see it. At that point, he handed it to me. When I read it, it was not signed by a judge. It had a judge's name typed across the top. The officer had signed it, the warrant himself. And he said on there that he had witnessed he had reason to believe that I had been mutilating myself trying to remove chips from my body. That was not what happened. I showed him signs of scratches, bruises, and other marks that had been put on me. Now, the good part about him coming at that particular time is another time that officer had been talking to me, the same time he mentioned being in Marines Intelligence, I had someone listening on the phone who was also a TI. And that T.I. had been seeing a therapist who was trained in deprogramming mind control pro, uh, victims. Uh, so that officer also said to me, when you fell down the hillside or when you was in a traffic accident, did they take you to the hospital? He said they put chips in you when you have to go to surgery. Now, he said the chips, but then he later blamed me for saying you know, blame me by saying he thought I had chips in me. Now, this woman had written an email to that psychologist stating what she had heard. And gratefully, I still have a copy of that. And it confirmed what I said and that, that, that the uh, sergeant had lied on me. But nevertheless, the, um, the director of the Institute Against Domestic Violence in the African-American community told me to go with them. He said, go ahead, go with them. He said, but call your lawyer and call the domestic violence advocate. And that's what I did. So when I got to the hospital, I told the doctor what had happened and what was happening. He said to me, I see no reason for you to be here. In two hours, they released me. Uh, the significance though about that visit is the domestic violence or I guess the, the nurse that is the supporting person in all of this, she also talked to me. That nurse is the wife of the judge in Mount Pleasant. And so they labeled me as delusional. I, I, I worked to the hospital twice. Sorry, um, just sorry to interrupt. Just a second, Millicent. I think your camera is um, shifting up. Can you turn it down so that we can see your face? Because sometimes you can just see the okay. ceiling. That's fantastic. Okay, that's sorry, please continue. Is that better? And now I can't, I, can't, I can't hear any of you. Can you hear me? Um, I see. I, I, we can hear you fine. We can hear you fine. It's when you turn it up, then we can only see the ceiling. Now I can see you fine. Um, okay. And now I can oh. also hear you fine. Okay. And well, I want you all to know that. Sorry, we're following your story very, very well, Allison. Sorry. Yeah, I wanted to follow up very quickly with the obscenity of bringing somebody in to say that they're 
crazy and then having the psychologist or psychiatrist dismiss them by saying they're only delusional. Well, no, this is, you know, basically the psychologist or psych, uh, psychiatrist is saying, I don't know about this. Therefore, I'm imagining this person is delusional and that is just not right. And that's my comment. Well, Karen, you know, what's interesting is that that nurse, she was just a nurse. She wasn't a psychiatrist. She wasn't a psychologist. She was a nurse on the staff of the hospital. Um, but now previous to that, the police department's domestic violence representative, who is also an officer, had referred me to the Department of Human Services as a danger to myself and others because I was complaining of the stalking. She didn't talk to me, nor did she see me. She just made that referral. Now, I later filed a civil rights lawsuit in federal court against that police department for all the harassments, and I will tell you about others. What I found out, though, is she was actually ex-Air Force, so she knew about the technology. That police sergeant that forced me to the hospital was Marines Intelligence, and it turned out that that LSD experiment is actually part of the MKUltra experimentation. So he knew about the technology. There was also the police investigator on that police force who told me himself, I was a Marine. So now we've got a, a really a militarized police force in a small town of about 3,000 people. What do you think that guy's getting away with down there? He's getting away with plenty. He's also been by his own admission in a police article, I mean, in a newspaper article in the middle schools sponsoring a, a reading program for fifth graders. I read that fifth grade is when the CIA wants to get their hands on these children because their hormones are out of are running out of uh, out of proportion and they are then able to blame many of the manipulated behaviors of a fifth grader on their hormones. That's really military involvement. So then this guy is sponsoring a reading program to fifth graders, a mind control expert coming from four or five mind control programming Air Force bases is in the school system running a reading program. What do you think is happening? Uh, a military police officer, uh, an ex-military police officer who lives in Toledo, Ohio, told me that he's setting those children up for torture. And yet they wanted to make me look crazy. That's not the worst of it. The police department here in Columbia in 2012 got my children to petition the court to have me examined. That ended with me being transferred from the local hospital to a private psychiatric hospital in Nashville that was affiliated with my former employer. Um, and, and there I was kept for eight days. Now, the interesting thing about that is the when they picked me up, the order said I was to be examined at the local hospital by two doctors or a doctor and a psychologist, and then released in no more than 48 hours. They took me to that hospital, kept me there for six hours. Nobody came near me but a nurse. And finally at 10 o'clock, they took me at 6 p.m., finally at 10 p.m., a person came from Centerstone, which was the place next door, to evaluate me. I saw a doctor when I was uh, first carried into the hospital emergency room. That doctor sat in front of the room where I was, and though I asked to see a doctor two times, he never came near me. Um, and when they finally decided to transfer me, and it was because I was asking to leave, after six hours, no one had done anything for me. I was asking to leave. A second doctor signed the transfer paperwork. Um, now, and the good part about it is that they always gave me copies of everything right at the hospital they gave me copies of all the paperwork and in the paperwork i got when i was transferred to the nashville hospital was that that the police investigator here in columbia had conspired with my children over a two-week span of time to get me well to get me examined or evaluated now i wasn't allowed to go to court 
I wasn't told that this was coming up. If I had been told, they could have talked to the person that had been counseling me for over a year and a half. And not only was I seeing that person here locally, I was also being seen by a marriage and family therapist in the next county. So there was no need for me to be taken to a hospital. But the police department, again, a second time was in a second town, was trying to get me labeled. I, you know what? I, actually, I, I just would like to inter interject. Number one is your screen keeps turning back up, so we can't, we cannot see you. Um, just keep it turned down. I think it's the camera that okay. just slides up. Now this is perfect. And you know, I just want everybody to know that everything you have said so far. I can confirm myself. Um, I just want to, I will let you finish the story. I just would like to interject in case people think, you know, you have, you've said so much, which for people who haven't met this corruption is so incredible. You know, most people already struggle with what we know and we have the patterns for is what you refer to as, you know, I mean, you said that he's talking in your head. This is well-known voice to skull technology. You know, they have many devices, they've got many methods with which they can pass, you know, it's like an intercom system. It's like a fancy direct to the brain intercom system. You can do it with microwave beams, you can use the fry effect, microwave hearing. You can, in fact, I saw one report which said that you can use two beams and they cancel each other. And whatever's left of the beam, that is what you hear in your head. So only where the beams overcross canceling each other can you hear the voice transmission. This is how other people in the room do not hear it. There's also um, modern speaker systems with which you can beam sound at somebody sitting in a library. It's perfectly silent around people, but the one person who's beamed that can still hear it. So there's many ways. Exactly. Holosonics. Holosonics, that's right. So it's now commercially available. You know, I mean, by the way, I think, I'm not sure how holosonics works. They say it's like some sort of waves. I, you know, they might also be using microwaves, in which case people microwave their head. But I know, I don't know. I don't know how that particular technology works. But there are some things where they actually use microwave beams, in which case you do microwave people's brain, which is not healthy. But that is just so for people to understand. So anybody who is in, in the Air Force and is given access to this technology, it is like using a mobile phone. It's like as if somebody can use their work phone when they leave the workplace. It seems to be the case that people, especially in the Air Force, but not just in the Air Force, once they are given access to the voice to scale technology, this intercom system, they seem to be just using it for fun. So they can just, if they have an interest in a woman, um, which is cases I've heard over and over, then they can just keep talking at her at will. And imagine with all the perverts in the, in the world, you know, with all those sad men, any man who's given this sort of technology, of course he's going to misuse it. So what medicine said is not unusual at all when you're dealing with these army and military types and air force types. It's like the standard complaint from these guys, you know, that one of these nut jobs just grabs a woman they're interested in and keeps talking at her day and night enforcing her onto her it is actually a form of rape it's a form of mind rape it goes way beyond actually just harassing somebody because you penetrate somebody's body it doesn't matter it's still with sound you put somebody's actual you know existence and presence into somebody's body and that is not even mentioning implants you know so it is mutilation and it is rape so women who complain about this are essentially raped. They are mind raped nonstop. So I just want everybody to understand that what Millicent says isn't outrageous. This is like standard operating procedure for sad bastards in the Air Force. And the Air Force is too disorganized or too corrupt to actually sort this out. It's almost like a bonus scheme like an employee bonus scheme. If you work for the Air Force, you can then stalk a woman of your own choosing until the end of your life and do whatever you want to her. That seems to be the Air Force you know, retirement package here because I've, I've heard now what Millicent said over and over and over. You know, that's number one. Number two, this nonsense with the psychiatrists. I'm sorry, I, maybe I'm going to offend a lot of associations here, but psychiatry is a pseudoscience. End of story. I've never heard of one person actually being cured. 
I haven't heard of any psychiatrist, or very few actually, who were able to certify somebody as healthy. Now that, in the scientific method, that is the, the first thing that any sort of test method has to, you know, um, actually satisfy. If you're testing for something, disease A, you should also be able to say if someone doesn't have the disease. If, you're, if your test can only fire positive, that's not a test. That is nonsense, right? So any sort of test should be able to say it's A, but it also has to say not A, like an AIDS test. You know, it has to say you don't have AIDS. So any sort of psychiatric test should be able to say you don't have delusion. And very rarely do these people say you don't have delusions. It's like a label. I'm sorry. And then also the other thing is psychiatrists seem to be working with checklists, like, you know, box ticking, like checklists and questionnaires. I'm sorry. I don't know a single branch of science that works with questionnaires or checklists. If in physics, I would try to devise a checklist for a standard test, you know, I know, I, that would just go bottom up. My colleague couldn't do it because it's far too rigid. And we're talking just particle physics, not actually human beings. So it's nonsense. Anything that comes with a questionnaire is nonsense as far as I'm concerned, you know. And on one hand, we have hard science and engineering saying this technology exists, you can abuse people. And you've got these airy fairy pseudoscientists, frankly, wafflers, who just come in and, you know, make diagnosis. No, it's, it's not. It's just an opinion as far as I'm concerned. Amusing. When you come in and a psychiatrist says you've got delusions, it should be taken as an off-the-cuff opinion of someone, you know? It's nonsense. And I think it's now about time we actually all start talking business and we call these people to account and we hold them to account for every false diagnosis. Because when doctors make a diagnosis, they have to put their name to it. Their insurance covers that diagnosis. And the same must be true of psychiatrists. So we have to go after these psychiatrists and sue them for false diagnosis. Because it's either malpractice or it's corruption. That's my view. Let me quickly, let me quickly add as far as Millicent's uh, experience with the voice to skull. First of all, the military used it in Iraq. They called it voice of God and they bragged that they sent this message to Iraqi soldiers saying, this is Allah, drop your guns and surrender. They bragged about that. It exists. Let me tell you also that President Putin of Russia confirmed that they used to use that with their agents so that they couldn't be discovered having any type of communication device. He said, and I saw him say it, and it was translated, and I know a little Russian, so he did say this. Um, <laughs> he said, we used to use it, but we found it was giving our agents brain damage. So we stopped. Yeah, because they were microwaving their brains, you know? <laughs> Catherine, you know, I'm a trivial thing. Go ahead. I, I actually received from Army Intelligence and Security Division at Fort George Meade unclassified documents uh, that confirmed microwave hearing and microwave heating. And it also talks about the damage that the microwave heating does to the tissue. But it says someone who did not know of the technology would think they were hearing voices. It says it specifically. I actually struck up a conversation with one of the women that, that uh, had signed, well, that worked in that office. And when I placed my, my four-year request, I got back a response in three days. Unheard of. But they sent it to me. I called back because when I showed the documents to my former pastor, who was a commission officer in the Army, he said to me, you don't have the whole document. So I called them back and, and I asked for the rest of the document. He said, we, we gave you enough. And I said, well, I plan to publish it. Is that okay? He said, we want it published. So I, I filed those documents in my county courthouse where they cannot be disputed. Um, the other part of that, though, it, and, and I'm just trying to weave the involvement of two police departments, but one police department in a small town really running roughshod over the people who are experiencing military technology, military experimentation uh, by police officers who are actually 
ex-military or they're actually military, still militarily involved. What I read was every police department in order to get the federal funds have to have one to two slots in their department that is specially for intelligence. So that sergeant who was coming to my house and said he had been in Marines intelligence was probably the military, the uh, intelligence representative for that particular police department. When I filed the federal lawsuit and it was against the, that police department and specifically naming those players who were involved in harassing and, and um, invading my, my civil rights and constitutional rights, um, that sergeant quit. Once they got the notice of my suit, he quit the, the department, and the female who was ex Air Force quit the department. Before I filed the suit, the police investigator quit the department, and then the chief of police quit. So now there are four people that were involved in my in in my um, victimization that left the force, and three of the four were involved in the military. You know, I think these people shouldn't evade justice just by quitting their job. We need to go after them. Like, they have to be hounded down because they're criminals. They've committed crimes against humanity. And, you know, there's an entire list. I think we should put in complaints because the other thing that we did recently, both Karen and I, um, is that we called. We, we, I, we both spoke to... Um, to Captain Troy Potts of Columbia Police, and we both spoke to Chief um, Tim Potts at Columbia Police. And both Karen and I, we said he has to act urgently in your case. I explained everything about te technology and what was involved in your case, and I explained why it was so urgent that he act straight away. And Chief Potts excelled in my books, by actually lying in the face, claiming that Humanistan hadn't sent him any evidence, which was just a day or two after he received an email from you with evidence where I was even included in the email visibly. So that takes some believing. A, a chief of police lying somebody in the face, he must have very bad memory indeed. Um, but I was included on that email and I've seen you have sent me the emails you sent him over the years and I can confirm that Chief Tim Potts is a liar. He is a liar and he refused to act in your case after a retired NSA intelligence analyst and an actual physicist called him and demanded he act in your case. So this man has to be removed from Columbia police force because he is corrupt. He is corrupt. He refuses. What he does is he treats you as an outlaw. You don't have any rights. The normal rights, constitutional rights, or the normal protection of the police does not apply to you. That's what he essentially does. That is not just discrimination. This is criminal. This is, it, is a, it is a criminal conspiracy against you, Millicent. And, and Chief Tim Potts has to be removed, really. And he has to be brought to justice. The sad part about the, uh, the discrimination is even... I wasn't hearing Catherine. It's even when I go to other places and ask for help, they always call back to this area to, act, to confirm that I'm a victim told is there's nothing to my complaint. Uh, I went to a state representative in 2011 and 12 who actually ordered the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation on two occasions to look into my complaint. Well, they first go to the local police department and they're told there's nothing to it. And so they drop it. In Ohio, where I was able to prove that this guy's crossing state lines, to uh, assault me, that then it becomes a federal, a federal crime. But when the police department in Ohio call back to my hometown, they're told there's nothing to my complaint. So I was actually told in Ohio, in Eaglewood, Ohio, their police department told me they were gonna just let it 
end in Tennessee. I have that in writing. They were going to let it end in Tennessee, though I lived in Ohio. And right now I'm fighting with Ohio, uh, with the Ohio Attorney General's office, trying to get victims of crime compensation for injuries and medical attention that I received while I lived in Ohio. And they're trying to make me ask Tennessee to pay it. I, you know, the other thing is that um, as far as police is concerned, I also called, in your case, the FBI in Memphis. I called and I said, you have to act and you have to get the file from Chief Tim Potts because the man does not act. And I was cut off. The, the FBI in Memphis, which as a result, I would also like to call corrupt to the core, I was put through on the phone line, the first woman on, hung up on me. The first woman hung up. Then I called back again and I have the, the audio recordings. And the second woman hung up on me again. So I had to call back a third time and just make this clear. And then what they said to me, and this was weeks ago by now, what they said to me is that if they are interested, if they take up the case, they will call me. And I said, do you have any sort of contact? some email because I want to send you more evidence. And they said, no, you can't, you know, I think they referred me to the contact form, which only allowed text to be submitted. And I said, sorry, I can't submit any further evidence. How do I do that? Can you give me the contact of an actual officer who deals with this case? Um, and they said they will call me back and they haven't called me back. So as far as I'm concerned, the FBI is in Memphis is corrupt to the core. And the head of FBI in Memphis has to be replaced together with Chief Tim Potts. In fact, I should look up the name so that we can name the guy for the record that this guy has to be removed because he doesn't do his job. That's I mean, that seems to be the specialty of the FBI is to make excuses as to why they can't possibly do their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was told by the domestic violence agency in Ohio that because so many ex-military, uh, so, so many military veterans are part of the police department or part of law enforcement period, whether it's FBI, TBI, or, or police departments, she said they are slow to investigate each other. That's why she said you'll probably not get the result that you desire. Good old boy network. Um, yeah. And you know, that's called corruption. It's called conspiracy yeah. to, to, to um, you know, um, to, to commit murder, basically. That's what it's called. Um, hang on here. Here's, and I also noticed that there's an FBI office in Bern in Switzerland. Maybe I should pop down there and have a chat. <laughs> Why, not? Why not? Why not? Oh, here it is. Special agent in charge of the FBI in Memphis. Yes, I remember the face seeing it. It's Michael Gavin. So Michael Gavin is the person who ultimately answers for this. Now, Catherine, I was referred to the Memphis Terrorism Division of the FBI in 2008. That was when I first started being nightly talked to and nightly assaulted by that person in particular. And that particular, uh, that person said to me, and I do have their phone numbers. I've got their names written in two or three different places. We can get my phone records to prove these conversations took place. But that person told me, he said, did, they, did, did you agree? Because what the person using Randall Webster's voice said to me in 2008, and he was broadcasting to the community, was that he was using me as a research subject. You know, he admitted when that it was with he admitted that it was without my permission and that he that I could sue his he kept saying you could sue my pants off. You could sue my pants off. So that that uh, federal investigator asked me, did you agree? I said no. He said, Well, who's chips? You know what, Minister? So just one question. You know when you say um he was broadcasting to the community, do you mean that other people had voice to scowl from him as well? They do, but they don't admit it. Now, I do have, I, I do have research documents that prove there's a broadcasting system in my body, and that makes me an antenna. So wherever I go, he can use me to broadcast, and that's what happens. Now, he can also 
uh, what they call jumping, I think, frequency jumping, frequency hopping. He can also hack into the radio frequency, the fr radio frequencies of the radio stations in our area. So in our small town, we had a radio station who had an antenna. And in, in this town, there was a black gospel radio station that, you know, at night when they turned their volumes down, he could hack into it because he always would make his appearances in the middle of the night. But it seemed that people around the county would be up listening to whatever he was saying. He was supposed to be giving them instruction on how to survive and what was coming against them. But he was also planning to destroy my body in the meantime. He said he set me up so that he would be allowed to torture me to death and not have to pay for it. Well, he's wrong. Let me interject here. Uh, we have a listener on that is looking up all the people that are associated with all these agencies and uh, we'll be able to give, give this to you at the end of the uh, broadcast. Thank you. Because we want the names. We want the names now. Because these people are criminals. That's what we have to realize. It's deep capture by criminal elements. So any names. I'll be right back. I need to get the names of the people that I talked to in 2008. All right. And actually, by the way, sorry, just to say, when we're on the names, um, I also want to say, so the live sign monitor for, for our team has been offline because my WordPress was slowed down so that for characters to appear, it took like 20 seconds. After I complained about this publicly, the WordPress has recovered somewhat, so now I can actually work with it. So I wanted to put the live sign monitor back on. You know, it's not the first time um, WordPress was hacked from the back end, I presume. Um, and now, you know, now I, I want to put it back, but there's also the option for every single victim to put a blacklist. And these are the people whom we talk to who either actively attacked us or who maliciously refused, committed dereliction of duty and refused to act. Any other malfeasance in office, um, or mal I'm, there's different terms in the US and the UK, what it's called, but you know what I mean. So any sort of, um, you know, um, misdemeanor in office, um, we should put on there. Because as far as, I mean, every single thing that we say, we've got evidence for, and we're willing to say under oath in a court of law. So we should put it up there. Because the truth is also that we are being murdered. We are maliciously being mutilated and murdered. We, all of us have survived assassination attempts and we can be murdered at any point. And should something happen to us, the rest of us have to take this to court. And crimes against humanity do not have a limitation period and other people can bring charges. You don't have to right. do that yourself. Right. I'm not able well, to get my hands on that at the moment. I'll, I'll be quiet. Okay. No, I was just going to interject uh, that my targeting with electronic harassment came directly from retired deputy director of the National Security Agency, Bill Black Jr., because I dared to say the truth, which was that uh, NSA basically forbade anybody who was an intelligence agent, uh, intelligence analyst, to report warnings of 9-11, and we had them for several months before 9-11, and uh, it looks very much from research being done that those in the know were able to take out insurance policies and trust funds and properties in the names of the people they expected to be murdered and make a fortune off of their deaths. So Karen, I just want to state that for the record. Karen, hey, Karen you know, speak up. You're, uh, you're not as loud as the others and it'll be a variation. I want this to be a piece that someone can take this out and republish it. And I want everything to be loud and kind of consistent. So if you could hold the mic a little oh. closer. Okay. All right. Did you want me to say it again or is it okay? Why don't you repeat it? Because okay. that was I, very important information. Okay. Well, I am repeating for the record in this vein that I was targeted specifically uh, for electronic harassment by Bill Black Jr., who um, was the deputy director of the National Security Agency during 9-11. And I was targeted because I dared to say publicly that NSA forbade intelligence analysts at the NSA to report warnings of 9-11 for several months beforehand. And there is evidence that has actually been turned over to the FBI now and possibly the Secret Service 
that Bill Black Jr., among other people at NSA and elsewhere, took that knowledge of who was going to die, used their personal information like social security numbers, birthdays, et cetera, et cetera, and set up trust funds, insurance policies, and other get-rich-quick schemes like buying property in their name that would revert to the person who bought it upon their deaths. And these people made a fortune off of the 9-11 uh, victims. And like I said, research is being done into this, but the initial research and findings turned over to the FBI in a certain state, and I'm not saying which, but this is going to fall on the FBI. They know, and they need to be investigating it. And we are going to sessions and find out why the FBI is not doing its job, because these people murdered the victims of 9-11 and made money off of it. And I have been targeted because I know it and I said it. So for the record, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, also, your camera isn't in your face. It's that's getting, okay. getting, okay. Thank you, here we go. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. I, think it, I think it's really hard for everybody who uses a phone because you either speak into the microphone or you see the camera, so <laughs> by the way. And, and you know, Karen, it, it just stands to reason. Once these business plans have been established, it just stands to reason to assume that every single targeted um, or victim, you know, targeted individual, so-called, or otherwise known as the victim of law enforcement and intelligence agencies, will have something similar done to them. Yes. Yes. But yes. this is this is very, very good. Yeah, yeah. And you know, but this is very good because usually money um, and, and especially trust funds and things like that, usually there's a paper record. So, you know, and we know that the NSA has got access to everything. And given that this is domestic terrorism, surely these people can be tracked down. And should they not be tracked down, it immediately follows that there's deep capture by criminal elements. And then the criminal elements who refuse to act can be tracked down. So, you know, in, in the era of, of data all around, it should be impossible to commit these sort of things and get away with it. But I think what we have to do now, I think we're really at the boundary between the, the previous generations of criminal thugs and the new generation, and the old generation doesn't understand the power of the internet and the power of large database analysis. And we have to bring it home to them. Um, we have to bring it home to them that in the 21st century, it should be impossible. It's still possible to commit crime, but it should be impossible to get away with it for any length of time. Because all of these things that we talked about today, they leave evidence everywhere. Database uh, entries, you know, signal traffic, everywhere. You can track it. You can track it. And, and the way, and, and the point that, that we can call the FBI several times, not just the FBI, because also, you know, I can report crime and terrorism to MI5 and they refuse to act. I can report it to the Swiss police, criminal police and military police and they refuse to act. Well, when we continue publicly talking about it and we've got evidence that these people track every single one of our words because they echo them back to us in emails and they follow us as soon as we leave the house, it is absolutely impossible that the intelligence agencies who are in charge of you know, fighting terrorism do not know about our cases. So when they, when they are ongoing, it directly means that the people who are involved in our cases are criminals. They are the criminals. They are the Nazis. So again, our targeting has again database entries, yada, yada, yada. So it should be very easy to find these criminals. And this is what I want every one of these thugs and also their superiors and all the heads of MI5 to understand that when you've got cases like that, they have essentially signed their personal arrest warrant themselves. Because by not acting while having all this power and all these database entries, I mean, heck, I think I could write a script to pull out this information in a weekend if I were given access to this sort of stuff. It's very similar to what I used to do at CERN. You know, it's not looking for particles, it's looking for criminals. It's, it's not that different, you know? And I know that I managed to take several quadrillion events and pull out 40 and prove something, a physical process with that. And 
I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure if Bill and Kirk were here, they could confirm that we do have the technology to find these criminals very quickly. It shouldn't take longer than a weekend. So the fact that these criminals are not found directly points to the other criminals involved in this conspiracy. And, and I think we should all now start naming them. I don't even know what to say about the FBI. They are just, you know, they're more crooked than police. Yeah. It's so funny that Catherine would say that about being able to track them or, or to, because here in Columbia, I called the district attorney's office and he told me that they could, that they have a spectrum analyzer, that they could pick up the frequency, but they wouldn't use it, on, use it for me. When I was in Dayton, I called, Patterson. I called Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton and I spoke with this um, sexual assault response coordinator, told her my problem, told her that he was ex Air Force. She said to me, go to the police department, make a complaint, be sure they give you a case number. If you don't hear back from them, contact the victim witness director of the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department. She said, and tell them, I will help them track him. They never contacted him. Now, the most amazing thing was I was attending an intensive at the Marriott Hotel in Dayton. And twice I was coming out of the hotel. A man was walking into the hotel. One day, this man called my name. He said, hello, Millicent. And I just looked at him and said, hello. When I contacted the victim's witness director that the police department had not been trying to reach me, she said, but they told me that they'd already contacted you. <laughs> and I said, that didn't happen. I said, but there was a man who said hello to me as he walked past me at a hotel. I said, I wonder if that was him. Yeah, so you see the their, Yeah, that was their excuse to say, oh, we contacted her, we said hello. And no context whatsoever is unbelievably deceitful. Absolutely. Now, here last year, the chief of police, Chief Potts, did indeed tell me that they would, and, and I have that in writing. It was an email. He sent me an email, said they were going to assign an investigator to help me gather evidence for a grand jury hearing. They sent an investigator finally because he didn't come right away. I began giving him evidence. I began giving him people that I contacted. And including witnesses to some of the, the stalking events and information on four mechanics that could verify my car computer was being tampered with and that tampering could lead to me being involved in an accident. Right. To my knowledge, none of them got, got uh, contacted. Two of them were women, one woman who had been involved with this person previously and she was having the exact same kinds of stalking uh, activity. Another person had witnessed me calling her phone and, and my call to her was being redirected to a bogus answering machine. They never contacted them. I gave him a video, DVD video of my car being hacked on the interstate. Um, my mother was, was riding with me and she witnessed it. So I recorded her telling them she was a witness. I provided that DVD to police investigator um, Gideon. And then I began writing them saying, did you evaluate my, my, uh, my evidence? What do you think of it? He actually wrote to AT&T for my phone records. AT&T has been recording all of the hacking since 2011, at least my complaints, um, and he left out an, an clause, so they didn't respond to him, but I do have a copy of that. So I, I have proof that he even started the investigation. He just never finished. So then they told me, well, they didn't tell me anything. They told Catherine that my complaint was unfounded, but they wouldn't finish the investigation. It's always an excuse for people not doing their jobs. I wish I were paid to not do my job. I mean, good gosh, you know, I'd be a brain surgeon because I'd never have to do anything, you know. 
I, I think what these people forget is that they think, because let's face it, they are incredibly stupid people. I have to say, I mean, I spoke to some of them and they didn't strike me like geniuses. What these morons, let's say it, um, forget is that they think that they are okay because they haven't done anything. But refusing to do stuff is malfeasance in office. It can also be conspiracy to commit homicide. In some states, it's also called depraved indifference. And there can be a law against it. Not every state. But if you walk by a person who is being, let's say, beaten up or mugged, and you fail to even call the police, you can be charged in certain states with depraved indifference. And, yeah. and you should be. You should be. In fact, I think there's a similar law in Germany, which said, for historical reasons, because I remember distinctly this being really hammered into us at school, that if you, we see a crime, and we don't act, we are also partially responsible. This sort of turning a blind eye is not looked upon kindly in Germany for historical reasons. And despite this being the case, I wrote to the Bundeskriminalamt, so there's this German federal police, which is in charge of all the crimes that are A, um, extend beyond um, the, the inner state boundaries, uh, 16 states in Germany, the Bundesländer, and also go international. So my case is international. So I had to write to the Bundeskriminalamt. They sent my physical letter back so that it doesn't appear in my file. The, the physical letter, and in that letter, I, I named an arms dealer who was selling um, microwave weapons, which look like this and cost about 200 euros. Right? If you attach uh, what this guy you know, calls a signal generator to the back, you can murder somebody or seriously harm them in their own home. And he's selling that for 200. Sorry, I'm, I'm not just you know, handing a weapon there. I'm making measurements. I've got a measuring device attached. But I named the person who manufactures these and is selling them publicly on YouTube and advertises them as jammers, even though jammers are illegal everywhere. And these can be used as jammers for people. I think about 300 euros roughly you can buy it online i i sent that to the bundeskriminalamt they ignored that and i sent them a list of very famous people being attacked with electromagnetic weapons around the world including in germany and i sent them a list of victims that had been murdered with this technology within germany a named list of known murdered victims some of the mothers of two and single moms and stuff like that who were literally tortured to death and murdered within Germany. And the Bundeskriminalamt, the BKA, sends me the physical letter back. And not just that, when I uploaded a video onto YouTube where I publicly showed this letter, I read out the name of the person who actually um, handled that, and I read out my case number, and I uploaded this onto YouTube. I was assaulted with microwave weapons and I was using a little measuring device here which was going nuts and I put that video up online and it can be seen as live assaults you know after naming the BKA so not just do they not do anything they have this integrated weapon system whereby they mutilate you painfully if you dare to publicly say that and put it up on YouTube what is interesting for me is the Mount Pleasant Police Department actually in 2009 on the front page of their local paper had a, an article that they had acquired a non-lethal weapon. So they knew very well. I mean, they had, had them in their own arsenal. Now, the chief of police between 2011 and 2013 was Tommy Goats, the police investigator who told me that he was a Marine. His name is... Uh, was Captain Paul Westmoreland, the sergeant that was part of Marines Intelligence. And later I found out he was also an Army military police officer, was Jeffrey Taylor. The female who was ex-Air Force is, was Amy Dean. And she was, again, the domestic violence representative for the police force. Um, here in Columbia, I was working with a, an investigator, Richmond. He was responsible for getting my children to have me, uh, have the court requested to examine me or have me examined. Again, I wasn't allowed to come to that hearing. However, in the hospital, 
a lawyer gave me his time. When I and, and the and the uh, people at the hospital said to me, "You're going to have your day in court." When I explained my situation to the judge, she said, first of all, nobody obeyed the first judge's orders. She was to have been released in 48 hours. Then she said, and no one has proven that she is a danger to herself or to others. I order her released immediately. That hospital paid for me to leave there in a taxi cab. Let me I say can't that again. Read. They should have paid a lot more. <laughs> they should have paid a lot more for such an abuse, you know. I tried to get that lawyer to represent me against them, but he would not. Um, but it's just such validation yeah. because the hospital then began to document my torture. And when I got when I left there, they gave me a chart that showed how my blood pressure and my body temperature had elevated during my stay there. Yeah, I, 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 you know what, I, I'm so glad we have to put these names on record forever, basically. I just remembered that the name of the guy um, at the Bundeskriminalamt who handled my file was Rainer Marza. And I say that also in the video where I actually show the, the letter, the physical letter that was sent back to me, which so that it doesn't show up in my file. So that is also, you know, um, um, Dokumentenfälschung, I think, Aktenfälschung. So it's a like falsifying case documents in the police. It is. Yeah, so all of this is going on. So this isn't even unusual to talk about it. It seems to be the case that as soon as you start being assaulted with these microwave weapons, these things will be done to you and will happen to you by default, which means it's a program. It's a program. There seems to be a silent agreement. And now, going to the next level up, one has to ask oneself, how can it be what is the mechanism through which these people conspire? Because that's what's going to map out the network. And there are very, very few mechanisms. You either pay these people through the back door. There has to be a financial trail somewhere leading to these people. Again, investigators can look into all this, right? Or, which is also seems to be extremely popular, that there's some sort of other control mechanism in the background, which could be sexual favors, it could be pedophilia. So I also expect that when we're dealing with these um, targeted individuals or victim cases, that the corrupt officials are somehow networked and possibly through a pedophile network because that seems to be just one of the standard things. So these people have either a money trail between them or something else. At the highest level, I would expect pedophile rings. I would expect pedophile rings. I would expect abuse rings. I would expect serial killers, those at the highest level. At the lower level, I would expect a money trail. Um, victims mentioned that um, sometimes their neighbors would, um, who would have very low paying jobs would end up buying themselves fancy cars, going on fancy holidays that they started talking about. So they seem to be given presents, you know, for the stalking. But again, these things can be accounted for. And we do have accountants who have an eye for these things. You know, houses bought, mortgages paid off, cars obtained by some means. We can track these people down. And now those investigators who are left in the world who are still doing that job should go after these things. Every single victim who is on YouTube, on Twitter, anywhere, you can map out the network of criminals based on their testimony. And I think it's what we should do now is to say to all the victims, you know, if you are sure of somebody, you can, you can, I think, you know, you, you hear sometimes um, news reports where they say someone is alleged to have done something. I think we can still say the truth and say, we allege them. We have reason to believe that they have done this. Right. And we should collect names. Right. I, I think. I've, I've been wanting to jump in here because <clears throat> A couple of weeks ago, we launched a tsunami email campaign. And uh, that's one way all the TIs and everybody can get involved in solving this problem. I don't want to drop the ball on that. I want to, every time we have one of these forums, to remind you that we have an ongoing process to corner these people, if you will, uh, by 
first of all, making them aware that we're aware. We're massively aware. Millions of us are aware. And we are sending them email notices. Uh, uh, if you want to find more about this campaign, go to uh, Catherine's website, uh, stop007.org, and uh, you can get involved. I know we have people on the line writing in. They want to be involved. They're TIs. They're talking about being hit even as we speak. Uh, so it's time that we start the ball rolling on all this, all this stuff. And I don't want to forget about the tsunami email campaign, which is the first stage in a multi-stage campaign to bring this thing under control. I, I was just hesitant to interject this before because I don't want to distract from Millicent's incredible case. Um, so that's my two cents. Yeah, but you know, the more people who get involved with the tsunami email campaign, the more quickly people like Millicent get relief. You know, that, that we all get released. So yes, that was perfect timing. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Paul. And in fact, I also would like to publicly say that I apologize and it's my fault that the last couple of action days, the emails were uploaded really late. I was struggling here with personal attacks and many other things and also with um, online issues and actual digital um, issues. Um, and sometimes it's they have a way to play with your mind whereby you slow down. Um, maybe some victims know that sort of thing where they literally disable your brain and you're cooked, your head is cooked and interfered with so hard. Everything that you do takes ages. Um, and they have ways to distract you as well and you lose your train of thought. So it's my fault. But from now on, every action day, um, the email list should be there in the morning. And the way the campaign works, for those who are new to it, so please go to stop007.org and the very first link at the top says tsunami email campaign. And what we are doing is we are notifying the entire world. I mean, okay, small caveat, all the countries who've got more, um, that have more than a million uh, inhabitants. And we are emailing um, six countries and two US states on every action day. And there are three action days per week. So every action day, we email another part of the world. And we're going just um, sequentially to increasing population numbers. So we started with the two smallest US states, and every action day, we pick the next two, the largest, the next biggest, and so on. And we're doing the same thing with countries. We're bundling six countries together. We have to get through 156 countries in two months. And by the 1st of June or by the end of May, the entire world, all the officials know about it. There's a template that you can send. You can send your own email version. And the point of sending these emails is not to spam these officials, but to bring it home to them. How many people know? Point number one. Point number two, to give them an official notice that these crimes are going on in their country. And the third one is to create liability because the people we are contacting, for example, in the US, we're contacting all the fusion centers. They have a statutory duty to act. They have a statutory duty to fight terrorism. So when they've been notified that this terrorism is going on, they have to act. And I encourage many people to take part because sometimes email accounts of victims are sabotaged, so emails don't get through. But they cannot sabotage everybody's email. I mean, they can block email accounts, but then it should bounce back. And either way, as soon as you send an email, you can prove in a court of law that you yourself will have a handle on these people because you can prove in a court of law that you personally have notified them. So you can make a copy of the email and just send it. So it's very simple to create an administrative um, responsibility for these people um, in a way that you can check yourself by just on every action day, which is Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, you go to stop007.org, you click on the link for the Tsunami um, email campaign, and there is a, a file called copy and paste. You click on that, and all you have to do is copy the, the email list and paste it into your email client and take the template text, paste it in, and click send. So two copy and paste um, operations and one pressing the send button and you already help us to save these victims. And, and the important thing is that I wanted the system to be decentralized. So every person who sends an email has um, a copy of the email so they can prove in a court of law that these officials have been notified. So if we play it right, then by the end of the 
by the end of May, um, a lot of people will have um, legal, legally valid evidence that all these officials know. So we're contacting embassies, we're contacting governors, senators, also the media, for example, the US states. And, and I should also say that we are inviting help with creating these email lists, especially with the countries we do not have local knowledge and it takes a lot of work, especially if you don't know the language, to find an email for a local media service. And we want to also contact the press. And Catherine Austin Fitz, who um, you can also find online, she floated the, the idea, and I think it's a very good point, that as we're moving to court cases, we can also sue the press. Because for decades, they have willfully covered up crimes against humanity. That is a crime. They have been notified. I can tell using systems analysis and statistics that all major newspapers must have been told by now. But we can also dig out actual, you know, concrete evidence. And they have willfully ignored what must have been hundreds, if not thousands of reports of exactly the same crimes. So they are guilty of conspiring to cover up crimes against humanity, which is a very severe charge indeed. And so every, everybody who takes part in the email campaign, if you are not from the US or you're not from a European country, if your country has more than a million people, you can still get involved. If it has less, you can still get involved by sending the email yourself and do use exactly the same mechanism. Um, so that's what I encourage people to do. So this is actually phase one. We send the emails to create liability for these people, to let them know. And by the end of May, there isn't a big country in the world that has any excuse to have these crimes ongoing. They cannot claim we didn't know. And by the way, this German sentence of wir haben es nicht gewusst, we didn't know about that, was used prolifically after the Second World War, um, claiming that they didn't know about the Holocaust or generally about other atrocities that have been going on in the, in the war because there was more than just you know, one atrocity. People claimed, I think also including at Nuremberg, that they didn't know about it. Well, this doesn't fly with the tsunami email campaign anymore. No one can claim they didn't know about it because we can prove that they've been notified. So that's it. And then the final point I would like to make is that if you, if you are from a foreign country and you would like to submit your local email contacts, um, and by the way, this can also include, I don't see a reason why it can't include your local chief of police. The only thing it needs to have is a statutory duty to act or to be a press um, outlet like a media or human rights organization that should be interested in this case. Please send us the, um, your email suggestions and send them to, I, I think it's, um, is it contact.tsunami? Oh, no, it's tsunami.contacts or something like that. Yes, yes, tsunami.contacts. Um, I also had one tip very quickly. Sometimes when you do a whole big email list and you send the, uh, the email to a group, certain servers will reject it because it has multiple emails and it thinks it's spam. If you get a, uh, a message saying, hey, can't send to uh, chief, what's his name, uh, then, uh, you know, as a group, then send only to chief, what's his name, and it'll get through. Okay, so anytime you get a group of emails, and let's say three of them don't go through, then resend to that particular email by itself, and it should get through unless there's a typo or there's a, you know, the, uh, you know, that they made or that um, that old email just doesn't exist anymore. So we're trying to ferret that out as much as possible, but the vast majority that get returned are because of a server thinking it is spam. So just use that particular email by itself and send them a loan copy. And that's all you have to do. Yeah, that's a very, very good point actually. And then I also would like to say, so we've got two emails, one of them, um, is tsunami.contacts at gmail.com to send your email suggestions for your local country. So as I said, officials with statutory duties, police officers, governors, senators, you know, um, people in government, but also human rights organizations and press and embassies as well for that country that we're contacting. Um, and, um, you know, local police chiefs can also be included, no problem at all. Um, and, and it's probably very, very good psychologically if they suddenly get a lot of emails from all over the world saying that they have to act on this. Then I also would like to say when you send emails, try to refrain from sending attachments. So try to put, the, for example, the template email into just clear text. 
because sometimes attachments um, get rejected by email filters as well. And then the final point is, please, if you are drawing up your own email list, include the 2017.tsunami at gmail.com, which is our email um, address that will then have a copy so that we can prove that you have sent email. We, so have, we have someone on, yeah, on the chat that's saying, FYI, the email addresses are not working with over half the names. And that could be because uh, people switch uh, positions so quickly now. I know back 10 years ago, it was three years was the average that someone would stay. And I would imagine that's even speeded up now. You may have to relook and find out who who has who has changed and who is in that position now? It might take a little bit more work, but take the time to do that. We we're stopping a huge problem here, and uh, yeah. it's worth a little I'm, extra work. Yeah, so I'm going to be do, I'm going to be doing that going back over week one and week two. Right now, I'm trying to go through week three with a fine tooth comb, and I found some problems, and I, and I am correcting them right now. Actually, I should also apologize because the email list that should be now um, up online today for today's action day, I, I think two things. Number one is I, I might have forgotten to include 2017 tsunami at gmail.com. So please, if you use that list um, during the show, please include that. I will correct that. The second thing is I didn't actually get to check it. Um, I didn't manage to send um, an email today. In the future, I should check first, and these problems should be ironed out. It's just that, um, you know, as this um, person was writing in during the show said, they are being attacked during the show. So am I. And I think so is Millicent and so is Karen. You know, Karen is outside because she couldn't connect because the radiation is so intense. Her phone doesn't work inside the house. So that's why she's outside. So that's, you know, we, we're not being sloppy. We're literally fighting for our lives. So please just um, bear with us. And, and also any email that just, you know, we don't even need to get all these emails to get through. It just has to be a critical mass. And then it's undeniable and anymore. But in future, I will take, make, take better care to have everything ready on time and have everything checked. So that's my fault, you know, sorry. Well, we're also, thank you for your input. I also thank the people for their input. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your input, Karen said, if you couldn't hear. Uh, yes. Also, if you have a way to communicate on Facebook, get the Tsunami campaign out on Facebook. If you know somebody that has a podcast, YouTube uh, channel, have them plug this Tsunami campaign. The more people we can get involved, the stronger uh, our appeal is to stop this. And uh, better will be for stage, set up for stage two. Actually, so that's, that's you know what, Paul, thank you so much for saying that because that's another thing I wanted to say to everybody who's listening and I should put it up on the website. Also, please feel free to duplicate the website, the Tsunami email campaign on your own website. I don't have a copyright on this sort of stuff. The email lists, please duplicate them, download them, upload them yourself, tweet them, spread them absolutely everywhere. And um, it, there's no copyright on it because there's no intellectual property involved here. So the, what you could upload to your website is, for example, the schedule for the Tsunami email campaign. It just lists all these states in, in order of size towards increasing order, uh, increasing population size, and 156, the biggest 156 countries in the world. So you can regenerate you know, your own campaign. And I encourage people to please do that. Please mirror this website on your own website. You can also send emails after the action days. So you can catch up with emails and send them later. It doesn't matter. It just has to go through. That's all it has to be, you know. Um, so you can send emails later and, and also, you know, use all the documentation. And if you can translate this um, into your own country, uh, into your own language in your country, please do. Please, please, please do. And have, uh, you know, the same site um, and tweet about it and send it on Facebook. So I don't claim any sort of ownership over this sort of stuff that's up on there. Please duplicate. And um, just a final word, when people visit my website, maybe some victims are also interested. I'm trying to put together um, what I call the information pack for victims. What is on the information pack right now are um, a quick guide for how to go to approach the police and what to expect then a list of the typical nonsense that they will give you and how to step through that. 
Um, I am also about to upload a list, a 30 page list of FAQ about targeting that you can give to your family or the police or anybody um, with all the um, important questions with my name signed. So I stand by everything I write in those things. I'm also uploading um, uh, very interesting victim reports. So um, there was one victim who um, wrote me a description about how lifelong targeting actually looks in practice and how people gang up on you and how this conspiracy, which as far as I can tell is based on the National Surveillance Network and so this sort of insider club um, of ex-intelligence agents and their informants, how these people gang up on, on people on blacklists um, for a lifetime. And will corrupt other people as well. And um, I, I, I received a very good description and um, how that can be used to systematically destroy human life, which is very much the point. Um, so that you can also do, and, and I'm collecting more information. Oh, yes, a patent list is also going to go up. It should have gone up long ago, but we've got a very, very um, comprehensive list of patents for the technology that's being used against us. So once people see the patents, it's undeniable that this exists. You know what, Catherine, I would include patents in my reports to the police department. I have one police report where the officer wrote on there that I brought 53 pages of, of backup documentation to them to prove that I was, you know, telling the truth. This was in 2013. I have police reports from 2011 and 12 where they would write in the report, she has given us extra evidence that strengthens her case or she's brought us uh, necessary documentation that proves it. They never challenged me on Voice to Skull. Not one time did they challenge me on it. They just didn't want me reporting it. Uh, but gratefully, they were documenting. And every time I called the police department and made a complaint, the very next morning, I would go to a walk-in clinic and have them document that there is medical evidence that I was telling the truth. I did the same thing with 911 because uh, at one point I was banished from calling the police department, but 911 encouraged me to call them. He, yeah. uh, one of the young men said, you have a right to report what's happening to you. So they would give me a um, non-emergency number for the Columbia Police Department to file my complaints with, and I would do that. I wanted to just add that this is the second email campaign that has happened in America. In 2012, Rhonda Pence, who is a, a former journalist, also launched an Email America campaign. I was featured in, in that uh, email as well. And they sent emails out, I think, to 26,000. Uh, every congressperson, every governor, every local level uh, leadership, they sent it to news reporters, news journalists, special interest groups, human rights agencies. So five years ago, there was also an email campaign that made people aware all over this nation that these kinds of criminal activities are going on. This is the second time, so it's like we're telling you again. Um, wow. I'm so proud to be a part of, of an organization that is doing this and, and making sure that the truth is known or that the truth can't be denied. They know it. They, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee knows as much about mind control experimentation as any other city or state city in this nation. And yet they still would rather silence one person because, you know, I'm, I'm reporting that the sky is falling. Eric, and they you know what? that before. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what now, and, and this is, a, I'm so glad you told me, I didn't know at all about the CMA campaign. So you said that was 2012, so five years ago. Right. And it was called Email America. Email America. See, fantastic. Fantastic. So that, that's already, so it's now the second time. And now it's not just America, it's now the that's entire right. world. That's what's so good about it. Yeah. And you know, I, um, the, the original... So I, I suggested emailing other countries as well. And, and I also invite everybody from around the world to email Europe and the US um, because um, this goes back to the founding idea of Amnesty International. So when Amnesty International was founded, um, it was founded in, in um, I think in London by a, by a British lawyer, by an English lawyer, um, if I remember correctly. And um, yeah, I think it was Amnesty International, exactly. And um, 
his idea was to get people who are incarcerated around the world um, out of prison. And he said, if, you, if people within the country where this prison is um, write to the prison guards or the, the you know, governor of the prison or politicians, it doesn't have the same effect as if people from around the world write in. Because as soon as people from other countries write in, first of all, the police, head of police can't get at them. But also, there's a psychological effect of the entire world knows. You know, when you get, literally, you have emails from Japan going to chief pots, you know, saying you've got to stop this crime. And then you have, you know, emails from everywhere, from Africa, from Asia, telling this dude, you know, to stop the criminality. It has a different sort of effect. It's, it's psychological. And this is how Amnesty International took off. And I, I copied that idea because I, um, I have to look up the name of the lawyer who founded it. But, um, you know, suffice to say that even when this guy founded it, a couple of years later, there was some sort of argument within the team that was running it. And he split off. He retired. It sounds like capture to me. <laughs> Someone else took over the idea. And by now, I can right. confirm that Amnesty International is entirely captured because I called them. They refused to report or help me. And not just that, they told me over the phone that they received a lot of reports about microwave attacks. A lot of reports. And they refused to act. So Amnesty International is captured. And as much as they found, I think, an was it an agent in, in WikiLeaks, a Swedish agent? I can't remember. But we keep finding intelligence agencies, like rats, everywhere, right? We find them in the press. We find intelligence agents in the press and charities and companies. You know, they've infested the place. So I would, I would presume that this is why Amnesty International doesn't go up against the intelligence agencies because they have infiltrated it and they might already be running these things by now. There is well, that's definitely how you, Yeah, I'm that's sure. how you make sure nobody can get anything done is you take all of the watchdog entities, you infiltrate and castrate. Exactly. And by the way, this was the method of the Stasi. When the Stasi infiltrated West Germany with their agents, by the way, they had this trick of going for not figureheads, they were going for secretaries because the correspondence would run through the secretaries. So it's the gatekeepers. They infiltrated, wow. subverted, and bought the gatekeepers. So, you know, when we're looking at subversion in the press and in these charities, it might not be the head of the charity. It might be whoever is answering the emails. Well, that's Good old what NSA, Yeah, NSA did that in a lunchroom talk where they tell you, don't talk about anything in the lunchroom. Well, we did. I'm sorry. But uh, the lunchroom talk was that NSA basically had infiltrated the offices of every congressman and every senator that they thought might... Uh, be able to control the purse strings or control what happens to NSA interests and they wanted somebody in that office all the time so they could influence or blackmail the person to do things their way. So, you know, and they have no jurisdiction to uh, do anything to people in the United States. And they, they never had and they still don't and they do it anyway. And our lovely congressmen and senators who are on the oversight committees. Let me add while we're talking about notification uh, of the nation of the criminal activity that's going on. In 2012, after my um, psychiatric hospital experience, I, I wrote a change.org report. Actually, it was not just that, I also learned that special rep, rep, what is the reporter to the United Nations, Juan Mendez, uh, had presented a report on torture, cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment for persons who were forced into psychiatric uh, hospitals involuntarily. So when I wrote the change.org petition, it was in support of his report, and, and the letters were to go to every congressperson, to the president, to uh, state representatives, especially in Tennessee. Um, and then I named some other special interest groups that were to get a copy of the letter every time the petition was signed. The name of the petition is Stop False Diagnosis Leading to Forced Psychiatric Detainment to Cover Illegal Human Experimentation and Military Training Resulting in Torture. This petition 
is actually what gained us an audience with Juan Mendez, who is also a law professor at America's University in Washington, DC. He said he was overwhelmed with the response because every time the petition is signed, a copy of that letter went to all of those people on the list. So he got a lot of letters real quickly. Excellent. The petition was also uh, sabotaged so that a lot of people were not able to sign and people outside of the country were not showing up in my numbers. The petition ran for two years and then was closed in 2014. However, last year I got a request to reopen the petition and it's continuing to be signed even today. So that's an exciting thing for us because people are still being Baker acted. They're still being involuntarily committed. They're still being forced to take psychiatric, uh, psychotropic drugs when really they do not need that. It's all a cover up. So it's still being uh, exposed even by this letter. So actually right now, the letter is, is out there on the change.org uh, website, as well as the email America, uh, uh, the tsunami email campaign now going on. So we still have multiple ways that the nation is being made aware of these things happening. And individuals are also being able to make their names and their locations known by signing the petition. This is fantastic, actually. You know, Millicent, I signed the petition. Um, and, and we should put a link, um, maybe, um, Paul, maybe we can put a link below in the description of the video below. Yes. Um, that would be really good. And the other thing that you reminded me of, um, I am very pleased that um, the, the UN, uh, what's it called, Special Rapporteur on Torture, um, Juan Mendez, was informed. As it happens, I called Juan Mendez about your particular case. And one of the things that I found shocking about this man is that, I remember, I mean, you showed me emails you sent to him because he was included on the nearly daily reports you sent about your abuse, which you sent to Chief Potts, and you sent to me, and you also um, Juan Mendez's email was included. So I knew that you were sending him information about your daily torture and mutilation. And then when I called Juan Mendez, um, that was, I think, two months ago, um, he said, oh, yes, yes, I, I do remember Millicent's case. Um, he, however, retired, I think, at the end of October, if I remember correctly. Um, but he also said, I can't remember if he acted in her case. Now, that, I was outraged. This guy is the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. He gets sent almost daily emails by a, a victim who is, we are essentially victims of concentration camps. So he gets sent an email from a victim from a concentration camp almost every flaming day of the week up until last October. And then three months later, he can't remember if they acted or not. I'm sorry, Juan Mendez wasn't doing his job. I don't know what his job is apart from drawing a pension, but he hasn't been doing a fat lot at UN level. So I would like to put that on the record that I spoke to the man himself. He also told me that the next UN special rapporteur who we have to contact urgently, actually it's on my to-do list, is a Swiss guy located in Geneva. So I should be popping down and paying him a visit. I think his name was, what was it, um, Meza? Is it Neil? Something like that. I have to look it up. My, my notebook is, um, oh, it's here. I'll, I'll find it in one moment. Oops. I'll find it. Um, and, and we should contact him as well. And should it turn out that this new guy is also all he does is draw a salary, we should have him removed as well. You know, William Binney said at some point in one of these interviews, he said, you know, you can have these people removed. You can have these officials removed. And we should. We should. Every guy who's not doing his job is either part of a criminal conspiracy or is just, you know, committing the reduction of duty. So they should be removed. They should not draw a big paycheck and, and the big pension plan. No, I mean, some of them basically are parading around in their little uniforms and that's all they're good for. Right, the UN, this morning I just posted an article on uh, HuntingUtopia.wordpress.com about uh, UN peacekeepers being involved in child trafficking all over the world. 
Good. Good. So it's all one rat's nest for uncovering it. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you're you're liable to be arrested and uh, executed for being a decent person at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's a crime against humanity. Anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. It's like, uh, would you lie for us? Would you steal? No? Then off with your head. Absolutely. I just found the um, the um, the contact for the um, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. So after, so since November last year, um, the new guy is called Niels Melzer. So that's N I E L S Niels, and Melzer is M E L Z E R. And um, he's a Swiss national. He's located in Geneva. And if I I, I inquired, and I think his um, assistant. Um, whose um, contact um, I was given is Alia El Kati. So that's A L I A, Alia, and then um, El Kati is um, E L K H A T I B. And the email, uh, please let me read this out because people should contact these people. Um, it's A E L K H A T I B at O H org. So that is for all those torture victims to get in touch with the new UN Special Rapporteur who hopefully will do something. Hopefully. Well, we just keep trying until we find somebody who can or will. You know, you shine a Klieg light on it for all to see and then it gets more difficult for them to say we didn't know anything or we didn't see anything. And you say, well, you got a hundred emails. How did you not know something? Exactly. And at the end of the um, tsunami email campaign, we should be able to just prove that they were lying with multiple emails from multiple sources. Um, so it's not something that they can ignore, you know. And um, and then also, this is, as, as um, Dr. Marco pointed out, this is just phase one. Phase one is to create this public liability. And phase two is to, to you know, um, um, make them accountable, which means to um, initiate, um, what's that, what are they called? These um, uh, procedures against police officers for corruption, actually submit complaints and have um, all these processes started, and then also court cases against them personally. Because this is what we have to remind people of, that first of all, ignorance of the law is no excuse, number one. So they can, they, they are very, um, they, are, they are free to run around thinking that they can murder people, mutilate them in their home. However, I don't think that's what the law says in any country. So that's no, number the Constitution one. Says that. And if a law goes against the Constitution, probably in any country, it's not, it's not valid. Exactly. So operating under illegal laws? Are you kidding me? How, in a, how can a police, uh, you know, any type of police operate under laws that they know are not constitutional in their country? That is beyond dereliction of duty. Yeah, it's, it's flat out criminal. They are criminals. Yeah. Criminals got into the police force. So that's deep capture. Caption has to be written, solved. But also, this is not, this is not a, a gray zone of law. You know, this is not like those, those fancy, you know, typically in the commercial courts where they are splitting hairs because every hair split is worth several million. This isn't like that. I think every police officer should know that mutilating people in their own home is a bad thing. I think any police officer who can't wrap their head around these basic facts shouldn't be in the police force. So well, exactly. it's not nice. Know. And that, you know, they're basically saying these people can uh, harm you, they can kill you, but oh no, you better not defend yourself. Are you kidding me? That's a basic construct of life is that you have the right and the instinct to defend yourself. But they'll come after you for doing that, but not, you know, a uh, hundred people who are planning your murder and then have you in some kind of uh, insurance fraud scheme. That's okay. But defending yourself or even talking about it, that's a crime. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And, now, what, and happened, what happened to this thing? There used to be a thing, and I know it's still going on in the United States, called the Oath Keepers. Karen, uh -huh. you, I know you've heard of it. 
Uh, yes, that's I made reference to it because, you know, the Oath Keepers are trying to get police to understand the Constitution and why they took their oaths. And what does that mean? That means that you do not enforce illegal or unconstitutional laws or concepts. And that's why earlier I described the police now as oath breakers, because they haven't the vaguest idea what the Constitution is or the fact that if it's a law but it's unconstitutional, it doesn't count. It's void. You know, I mean, you can make a law that says um, if you spit on the ground, the police can execute you. Well, that's totally unconstitutional. Just because you make a law doesn't make that a legal law. And if somebody, if a policeman walks up and shoots you for that, he needs to go uh, to the gas chamber. They've got to have some kind of common sense. They've got to go back and retrain the police in what the Constitution is. Hello. And then to tell them they have to follow laws that go with the Constitution, not contrary to, just because of someone's whim. And this gets back to being a country of laws, not of privilege, depending on who and what you are. And they have totally lost that. And they've totally lost that because they've sold their souls to the feds so they can get all the fancy toys to invade a country for using against Bill Smith because he and his wife have argued in a public place in a restaurant, you know, and they want to roll up a tank and blast the restaurant. They're just too excited to uh, get paramilitary psycho power to deal with people. And, they, and this means that they have no desire to speak to the person. Person's acting up, shoot them. Shoot them 24 times like Myron May, you know. Well, I think there's, I think there's, they're marching around saying that they're, you know, the whole idea of the Earth Ke Oath Keepers was, you know, when they take our guns, we're going to stand up for the Constitution, blah, 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 blah. Well, try, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's make sure that these uh, uh, crime fighter broadcasts get to a, uh, an Oath Keeper, somebody that's, that says that they're, they're, bouncing around saying they're going to defend the Constitution. Well, here you go. You've got a major violation every day, probably a million people in the United States being hit with these weapons. And where are they? Where are they? I and yes, exactly. And the militias, where are they? Right. I've written to some and been ignored. Right. If they contact me, we put them on the forum. You know? Okay. Let's get an oath keeper on here. But uh, you know what? We're not going to hear from them. Because they're going to the oath for certain things that they think are important, but not the assault of a million people in their, in their country. Sorry, Millicent. Go ahead. About two years ago, Richmond, California passed a resolution uh, called the Space Preservation Act. They actually adopted the Space Preservation, Preservation Act that Dennis Kucinich introduced to Congress in 2001. In that act, if you're not familiar with it, he actually talked about uh, mind control. He talked about the damage that can be done to a person's body via space weapons. And so the, the act essentially was asking the United States to ban the use of space weapons in our, in our space. Uh, so Richmond, California actually adopted that resolution to ban the use of space-based weapons in their city. Berkeley, California actually passed that act not long after it was uh, not passed by the United States Congress. So that is happening now and people around the nation are being encouraged to take the resolution that Richmond, California enacted to their city councilmen, to their city aldermen and see if they will also follow suit. I did take that that act and some other documentation to my city council. In fact, I put together a really nice booklet. My uh, was a sheet that I found that shows the Air Force being responsible for this kind of, of uh, criminal activity. Not the Air Force, but former Air Force veterans are being responsible for that. And so that was the cover that I, I did, and I took one book for every city council person for the mayor and the vice mayor. The mayor kind of heckled me, and they wouldn't let me speak that night, although I went on a, um, when they had their study session, so I was supposed to have been allowed to introduce something new. I did leave the booklet 
I contacted a city council person, G, maybe two months later, and he had never seen it. Huh. So I, I had to call back to the city manager's office and ask what happened to the booklet. The secretary says, oh, I was out when you brought the letter to go in the booklet. So it never got in their mailbox. I'll do it right now. Um, and, and I only found out by meeting with a city council person. My city council representative does not respond to me at all. He's, he's Caucasian. There are several, well, there are two uh, African-American city council members. And so I met with one of them and talked with, with him about my situation. I gave him information on the person that's me. He's former artist. He was not unfamiliar with technology. However, he began to get leaned on a conversation because he was really kind of willing to. However, I've never gotten to introduce that. Um, my my request to consider it to the council in person, though I did make that effort in writing. It, it just goes to show you do have to follow up and almost nag these people because they don't want to do their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't want, don't. They don't want to do their jobs, but they don't want to do their jobs in a very systematic way, which shows it is, it is, it is a conspiracy. There's a, there's a business plan behind this. They're getting money for torturing us. They're getting money probably from the weapons and pharma industry. They're getting money from the council. They're getting money to try out their weapons their new toys, as it were. So there's, there's, there must be some sort of financial flows to these people. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, what it comes down to in complex human systems is this rule. It's, it's also the, the, the fundamental rule of economics, which is um, people respond to incentives. That's just it. It doesn't matter what it says on the, on the law books. People respond to incentives given to them in the moment. So if we want to have this changed and these people are given financial incentives, we have to give them a counter incentive. And because we don't have money to be spent on corrupt officials, the big fat counter incentive is to get the sack and have a big fat court case for conspiracy to commit homicide. That's it. That's the counter incentive and it has to come. Otherwise, these people will not act. When you start pulling the administrative trigger on people, there's something called the chilling effect. Typically, the chilling effect is um, in practice is applied against victims by silencing certain victims or giving them a horrific treatment. You chill the um, you know, other people um, so they don't come forward. That's the chilling effect. But you can use the chilling effect in reverse. You can use it by administratively sniping out key officials and making a big fat example of them and destroying their career. You know how the, um, the stalkers and the informant network of the intelligence agencies destroys marriages programmatically and destroys lives and destroys careers. We have to do the same in return. I have to Not interject. Marriages, but careers. I have to interject here because we're running out of time. I'm not exactly sure when we started because we had trouble you know, with our internet in the beginning. But I think we're coming to about when we have to stop, otherwise Google will cut us off. So let's go around. Uh, we will have the uh, petition linked up uh, as soon as we can get it from Millicent. Millicent. And uh, Millicent, if you'd send us that, we'll link it below. Wow. And uh, let's go around final comments and then we can say goodbye. Um, Millicent, do you want to start? I just want to thank you so much for your interest and your time. I think you've already heard from me on a personal note, uh, and I look forward to our conversation. However, it is in, it's imperative that people are represented in this effort. And when I say that people are represented in this effort, in our small community that is in, in considered a rural area that is known to be used for research by military um, bases around us, the people are afraid to speak out. I have been being used as the example of what will happen if others tell on that person, if others try and, and uh, contact the police department about being assaulted and abused, and yet good people are being hurt. Um, my own children and, and, and granddaughter are 
a cinch to have to is to be under the the uh, influence of mind control technology. They're being used as as uh, trauma based mind control victims by the person who wants to keep them silent about his presence in our home, about the fact that he drove us to a movie in his vehicle, about the fact that he was making personal contacts to my younger child, who he said he took over her mind when she was five years old. So that means she's been under his mind control for 34 years. What are we to do in this town when there is one person with that kind of control, that kind of cover up, not just maybe on a local level, but also on a federal level. And yet our people are being exterminated. We're being exterminated by military technology, by a person who, and his, and, and others he brings in with him who have access. Thank you very much, and God bless you, Millicent. Karen, Thanks. do you want to say a few words? Um, well, I would say to people, there's been probably decades of learned helplessness, that they've reached out and nobody has helped them. But things right. are coming to a crescendo, okay? We've got patents, we've got numbers, we've got the technology to reach all these people with emails. Um, don't be discouraged get off your butts and do yet something more. Act like this started yesterday and by golly, you're angry, you know? And, um, you know, to go back to that movie, it's like, we're angry and we're not gonna take it anymore. Right. Get off your butts, quit telling you there's no, yourself there's no use because there's a regime change. Whether people hate him or love him, a regime change is opportunity, go with it. And if you have suggestions or if you have criticisms, Email the tsunami email. We'll take a look and we appreciate your time. We appreciate your, your effort. We appreciate your input. You know, we're trying to perfect it. And yes, if you missed week one or two, um, go back and do it. You know, go back and do it. It doesn't matter that they still get emails maybe in August. Just go back and do it. Spread the word. And by golly, let's make so many people uh, aware of this that they cannot possibly say, oh, we thought this was just a couple people playing a joke on us. Yeah. No. So please, this is the time. And we, we are saying now, 2017, it ends. Help us make that come true. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine? Yes, I would like to add that people, when they're watching this, um, what I get on my YouTube comments is people doubt that I'm a victim because I come across as so calm and sober. This is not how my life is. My life has been taken to pieces over the last year. I've been mutilated nonstop. My family life has been taken to pieces and all the other fighters on my website and Karen and Millicent are very similar. We are being, people have to understand we are being mutilated as we are on these shows. But the ladies you are seeing in front of you, Millicent especially, she's a Navy SEAL, okay? She is that great. She can withstand anything and still makes sense. Very few people in the world can. So what you're seeing in front of you is very high standards, higher than in the military who have let us down. So I want to say to everybody, if you want change, you have to support your leaders. You have to support your military leaders. And in the 21st century, your generals are not some, you know, poncy, stupid men parading around in funky outfits. The 21st century generals are people with integrity who fight with their entire life to change things and make things better. So do support your generals, please financially, emotionally, and in the campaigns as well. And we will do our best to help you. So thank you very much. If you're listening, thank you very much for your time and please help us. Well, thank, thank, uh, thank the uh, crime fighting team again. Uh, it gets real emotional at the end. I really love it uh, because we're all really coming together and we're going to do something. Remember, this is, the, this is the Third World War, and it's really not Russia against the U.S. or against Iran or who, whoever they're throwing these puppets up. It's us against the elite. It's us against the pedophiles. It's us against the perpetrators. And keep that in mind as you go forward. This is the first battle. This is the first battle, and it's to try to get some relief for these people who are targeted and the, the, the pedophiles, uh, by the pedophiles and by, the, by these perpetrators. Uh, so thank you very much for watching, and we'll be here next week. We're not going anywhere.
Thank you very much. Okay, great. One second, one second.